the car slips into this strange place, carrying the contents of a cash register. Ah, but things are not what they seem, for this is just a new kind of bank. Drive through is actually a, a fairly old American idea that uh, even Frank Lloyd Wright supposedly once designed uh, a bank uh, where he had the idea of a drive through window and the story is that he lost the commission because the bank thought it was totally ridiculous. Introducing online banking so easy anyone can do. Pay your bills, manage your accounts, do all your banking from the comfort of your home. I think the trend has not stopped. I think pretty soon uh, almost all banking will happen online and uh, in, a, in an immaterial way. The Bank of Smithfield, which later became First Citizens Bank, officially opened for business March 1, 1898. During its early years, the bank primarily served agricultural customers and quickly became a successful financial institution. In 1913, with capital and profits of $85,000, the bank hired the firm of J.W. Stout of Sanford, North Carolina to construct a handsome, brick, neoclassical building. Located on the corner of East Market and Third Streets in Smithfield, it served as the home office for First Citizens Bank for 60 years. And the South, if you look from the 1900s, was terribly capital deprived. Banks were not a service for all people. There was still a lot of bartering and, and people didn't have cash and they didn't need banks and uh, some of them were suspect of banks. When you think about the importance of the bank to a small town, it was solidity and permanence, both physically in terms of its structure, because often the banks were the best built buildings in town, and it also meant so there was some kind of financial security. Uh, we tend to forget the role of capital in developing our communities. And when you think about the limited variety of building types that one would see on Main Street, much of it was retail. There might be a church or churches might be on the separate church street which often happened and if you were lucky enough to be a county seat there would be a county courthouse somewhere nearby and there might be a post office. Uh, but the bank was one of the most important physical elements to say this town had arrived. Well they were typically at the center of the community and even though they are private buildings their gestures and their attitude was actually that of a public building compared to a post office or to the city hall or buildings like of that notion. So they acted and looked like and felt like public buildings even though they were private businesses. The classical language is not the only thing that's important in conveying this uh, sense of solidity and permanence. It was also the use of stone. That stone is a permanent material, it's associated with monumentality, uh, with memory, with a long-term commitment to place. Uh, if carving is involved, you can see that there's an intensity of purpose and interest and care, and all of those speak to the issues of we are here for the long term. In the old bank buildings, you actually didn't mind to wait there a little bit uh, and take in the atmosphere uh, because you felt you were doing something important we have to recall that banking was done in person. This is before ATMs, well before online banking, uh, and the transaction took place between person to person in this grand space. We tend to forget that people dressed a little bit when they went into town. There was this sense of occasion uh, if you went to the main street of a town. If you came to the bank, you dressed up. Ladies would have on gloves and hats. It became a social event. It became a one-time event. In 1929, the Bank of Smithfield initiated a charter change from a national to a state bank. This resulted in a name change to First Citizens Bank and Trust, and importantly, it enabled the bank to open other branch locations. We had one building until right after the Depression. Mr. Holden, I think, acquired first a bank in either Benson or Dunn, and the next one followed. They all had sort of a similar look. They were two-story or three-story, and they were about 20 feet wide, and they looked solid. 
the earliest um, appearance of something that we could compare with a bank today is actually the, in the treasuries of some of the archaeological sites that we visit in Greece. And there is one particular in Delphi that seems to anticipate many of the future images that came. It's a little temple with a pediment with uh, four columns in front of it and it's very small but it is really sort of the first bank that we that we know of. Even though there's a similarity in, in the banks in small towns and it's clear that this is the bank building and we have classical pretensions, um, they're each different. They're each a little different. As other banks failed during the Great Depression, First Citizens grew. Mustolan uh, acquired banks in Beaufort, uh, Fayetteville, then Raleigh. In 1934, First Citizens Bank purchased the Commercial National Bank building in Raleigh. The ten-story building, by far the largest the bank had yet acquired, was designed in 1912 by the well-known Atlanta-based architect Philip Thornton Mayer. At the time it was built, it was the tallest and most elaborate building in Raleigh. I really feel it was an example of the period that I would regard one of the best in American architecture. It still had some roots in, in tradition and in continuity, but there also was an innovative spirit. It was sort of a medium-rise building, which had some, a fair amount of technology with it, and I felt it was a building that was significant and important for a city like Raleigh and reminded us of where this city was at one time. First Citizens Bank and Trust Company moved its corporate headquarters from Smithfield to the old Commercial National Bank building in the early 1970s. In 1979, the importance of the building to the historical fabric of Raleigh was recognized by its designation as a Raleigh historic property, and in 1980, it was listed as a pivotal building in the Moore Square National Register Historic District. First Citizens Bank and Trust Company remained headquartered in the building until January 1990. The bank planned to destroy the historic building and five adjoining buildings to make way for construction of a new bank headquarters and office tower. I remember the papers were writing about it, that this is about to happen. There was some controversy whether this was a good idea or not. Uh, but the forces that wanted uh, this piece of property and wanted to make room for uh, something else prevailed and so eventually the building was uh, scheduled for demolition. As I saw the building uh, fall upon itself in dust, um, my reaction was one of sadness. I think I almost had tears in my eyes. I felt very sad to see this building go. I felt, what a loss. After demolishing the building, the bank canceled the new building project and the site stood empty for the next 18 years. Unfortunately, nothing survives like the pyramids. The internal structure starts rotting, decaying, the windows collapse and rot. So the exterior will be there, the granite probably forever, but there's a certain replacement philosophy in this country. You know, you go to Europe and they don't tear things down. In Europe, we have buildings, bank buildings that are buildings that are 600 years old, and uh, you know, gleaming with computers, everything works just fine. A lot of those buildings, those banks, are located in established central business districts, full of historic buildings. In order to add parking or drive-in lane next to the building, usually you have to take out a historic building. In the United States, I think uh, the car has really driven the banks to seek locations that are accessible by car and by definition that will not be possible uh, in a downtown location. So I think the best we can do is try to preserve the buildings but perhaps find some other uses for them because they are good buildings. I don't think, you know, if 
existing example serves uh, the kinds of buildings that have gone up in place of the ones that have been turned down, in my opinion, without exception, have been worse. You end up with a representation of solidity on a building um, that really has not been built to last. And um, I think people understand the difference. We build up branches for permanence, but uh, with some flexibility. It's easier to knock a hole in fiberglass than it is granite. It is like, you know, you extinguish a piece of, of memory in, 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 in your brain that is not there anymore. Something that we have forgotten. And I feel it's one of the important functions of architecture to be the materialized external memory of a community. And the advantages that we all experience them together, we have the same frame of reference. It's not our personal memories that we carry around in our head, but it's the memory that we share as a community that is materially given that we experience on an everyday, on an everyday basis. And so from that point of view, once the building is gone, something has been extinguished. Yeah. I don't think they can be replaced, no. Older city forms with their permanent buildings remind us that there are other ways to live. And I don't think it's an accident that so many Americans like to go on their free time to small towns where they can walk up and down the street and shop and feel like they are somewhere and so preserving the structure, the organization, the place of our small towns with their bank building as being a part of it uh, is important to us to provide an opportunity for rethinking how we live in the future. Well, I think we still recognize them as good buildings. And I think any time we have a good building, you are reluctant to tear it down, so you find another use for it. I think we have many times felt that if you build the building well and beautifully, even if it loses its function, somebody will find a different use for it. And I think banks belong to that category. Lie down. Thank you, dear. Mm -hmm. Lie down. Come here, Glenn. I'll put him away. When I was in high school, we had a Border Collie on the farm that, that we used for everything, and uh, we herded everything, including the chickens with her. The, the Border Collies are fairly easy to train because they have an instinct that for the work, and uh, we didn't really know how to train her, but we used her, she did the work that we wanted done. Way, get back, way back. We didn't have sheep until I was about, uh, I think I was about 12 years old when we got in the sheep business. And it just sort of evolved that way. That's, uh, I got into the sheep business and it, it was good to me and I stayed in it. And 
uh, showed sheep from uh, all over the country, judged many state fairs for several years, and uh, got to be you know, very successful in the purebred sheep business. And the dogs went right along with that. Uh, you know, we had, you, if you've got, I always think that if you've got more than two sheep on a farm, you need a dog. Henry's carrying a crook with him. And we'll show you why when the shepherd goes to the field, he carries this stick. You see there how you can reach under, grab that lamb. Now you can turn it over and work on it, look at it. He needs to, and see Dixie work. She brings those lambs right to him, holds them. When he's done then with his lamb, he turns it up and the rest of the Actually, I met Henry at a livestock show in Pennsylvania, at the Pennsylvania Farm Show. He was judging a sheep show, and, and my friend was there exhibiting sheep, and I was helping her. And of course, we were just having a bit of fun, if you will, and I went out and pretended I was judging that class. And he turned around, and there I was handling the animals like I was judging. And he started laughing, and we started laughing, and he came up to me and spoke and just started to visit. So it just went on from there. Okay. So we're going to have to watch her. I just love animals. I love to see them when they're born, to watch their progress as they grow. There's nothing like watching a newborn get up on its feet and get going and get nursing and then to watch that same animal, whether it's a dog or a sheep or a goat or a calf, just progress and grow and know that you're producing a good product with the puppies of course it's just fun it's just fun to watch them grow and grow into their own and get confidence with their instinct and be able to move the stock and, and just gain by leaps and bounds as they know they can do that and, and that's it's just very rewarding are you going to be a good boy mom yeah, I'm gonna grow up and be a big boy. Big sheepdog. We used to milk, and I used to milk a lot of cows when I was in when I was in high school. My brother and I milked 15 cows a day, uh, every day before we went to school and in the morning, and then separated the cream from the milk in a separator. We sold milk or sold the uh, the cream, fed the skim milk to the pigs. That's it. for the kids. <laughs> think that anybody that should have to work, they need to work on something they enjoy or they should get a new job. Well, I guess the most difficult part of, of this business, or the livestock business, is, is to figure out how to make a profit at it. It's just not, uh, it's not near the business that it used to be. Uh, I don't know, I don't really know why, but it isn't. making premixes for livestock, which was a vitamin mineral blend. It would be similar to the uh, vitamin mineral that you take to supplement that which is not in the diet. Really, the, the face of agriculture is just changing so drastically. When we first started in business in the state of North Carolina, 85% of our business was uh, swine premixes. And now, 
North Carolina, I think, is number two in the United States on number of swine produced, but there are only a handful, I'm going to say six or seven producers in the state. Everything is contracted, the same as poultry. So now there is not a niche for our product. It's all completely done by one company from the time the pigs are born until they're marketed in the grocery store. So there really was no room for us. And we've seen that happen uh, in swine and poultry and the dairy industry is going that way too. So it just is a changing facet of the agricultural industry. And when it got economically not feasible for us to do it, instead of taking any losses, we just said, that's it, we're closing. So that's what we did. Uh, that was difficult, and I know that seems inconsequential compared to, you know, I, I've lost both of my parents. That was very challenging and very difficult. But um, this past year, that, one, that one's been the toughest, is not having uh, that regular job. And I've got plenty to do, and I'll get some of that done, but I, I went back to work. You know, I started another business. I'm online doing a business because I must work, period. Uh, I guess I'm like a an old retired workhorse or, or racehorse. You know, you just don't take a racehorse off the track and stop it today. You have to kind of work it back. Well, right now, uh, at this at this stage in my life, I think most of my farming is is uh, pretty much a hobby. It gives me something to do to stay out of trouble, actually. Well, I had a, uh, I tried a uh, theater, and that didn't work out too good, and uh, I tried a restaurant, and that didn't work out too good. Uh, I was in, made donuts for a while, and that was not too bad. Uh, well, I, I have to have something to do to keep busy. I don't, uh, I just don't like to sit down and not do something. I've always had border collies ever since I was 15 years old, which uh, is quite a while. Uh, I do competitions with them and I do demonstrations with them and uh, around the country I've, I've competed all over the United States with them and we've been extremely successful. We've won many major trials in the national finals. We've won, uh, we had the dog of the year three different years. Uh, they're, they're a little tougher to do than some, and Lie down. Uh, I love to watch them work. Lie down. Come by, come by, come by. Boy, they're wild this morning. It starts with a pup, like this litter of puppies we have now. There's a puppy in that litter that I liked the very first week, and she may not be the best puppy in the litter. Um, John Thomas once told me, you know, when we're about picking a puppy, he says, what you do is you pick the puppy that you like and you make it the best. And there's something to be said for that when you've got good breeding because all puppies, you know, the, when you've selected as long as Henry has, and he's been breeding since the early 60s, we don't get puppies anymore that don't want to work. And it's just fun to watch them progress and uh, watch it click, if you will. And you know, we've had puppies at five and six weeks of age that we've had in the barn and they just get, when they see the livestock, they hit that crouch and they get down and they stare and the sheep actually respect them because they've got enough power in that eye that they move and those little puppies I mean they are on it like a big dog and they have full control of, of what they do and it doesn't matter how many puppies how many times you see it just every time you see it you know your heart just floods with like oh oh look at, you know you just are so excited and uh, from that step forward you're just off and running and it's just fun What, what it is, you got to have a good relationship with your dog, and you got to like your dog. The dog has to like you if you're going to ever do any good with them. They, they must uh, have your respect in, in order to train them. 
well, we we take good care of them and and uh, make get a bond with them. You know, we we uh, and we like them and they know it. You know, that's uh, about the only thing I can say about that. He doesn't like to, he wouldn't admit that he was soft-hearted, but I can tell you he loves his animals and he loves his dogs. And I've seen him break down, you know, when, when it has to be time to put an old dog down. And uh, he might be pretty gruff when you're around, but I'll tell you his dogs are loyal and they love him. And your dogs don't love you that way if you don't love your dogs. That I know. not a an eight hour job I mean when you're lambing you're with if it's a 24 7 for two or three days that might just be what it is with a 15 minute nap on the couch and never a complaint or anything else you know that you just do what it takes the same with the dogs you know uh, maybe that's it maybe it's just we're both silly you know with this work ethic that we have and uh, maybe we're crazy to to work the hours that we do, but we're very happy, so I don't think so. I think we're doing exactly what we want to do. Oh,